Right, Buzz. With one metre plus, that goes to, roughly speaking, 25% of passengers. So the increase isn't huge, 18%, 25%. And so there's a different figure for both the passengers that can be carried in a double-decker bus, single-decker bus, but also the carriages as well. The markings on the platforms are currently uh, two metres. Uh, we're not going to spend uh, a lot of effort, time, expense changing the markings because the advice is that you can keep two metres uh, apart, uh, which is what one metre plus is ostensibly about, one metre plus the other mitigation. Uh, but unfortunately, even with one metre plus, the numbers of passengers using uh, public transport won't, huge, won't increase hugely. OK, thank you. Uh, and according to the papers that went to TfL's finance board on the 24th of June, TfL were running about £30 million ahead of their expectations on their emergency budget. Um, now, I appreciate additional income will probably go to pay back government, etc. But what, what does this figure indicate on the future projections of TfL's income? Well, the problem is, this is quite dynamic, the movement. It can change day by day. It can change with different stages on the roadmap in relation to easing of uh, uh, restrictions. So, for example, this weekend there are more services provided because, obviously, with the Saturday easing, uh, TFL predicted more passengers using the network, which they, in fact, uh, did. So I wouldn't read too much into a snapshot in relation to where we are. Um, safe to say, on a regular basis, I'm, in, indeed, later on today, I'll be speaking to TFL, CFO, to see where we are. Uh, and so there is a running score, a run rate, uh, but the problem is it really is done and really is fluid. OK. I mean, we've only got snapshots at the moment. Mr Mayor, as you'll appreciate, and we're going to have to go and look at those as we go along to form the picture. In the meantime, have you been looking at the TfL staff perk nominee passes, which lost London a record £44 million last year? And at a time when we're looking at stopping under-18s from using transport, which is very concerning because they need to get to school in September. So at a time we're looking at having to put that burden on under 18s, are, are we at least looking at the nominee passes that would bring so much money back in or at least not be spent out? Well, Chair, I think you've inadvertently, inadvertently misled the committee and uh, those watching this. It's not true that TFL suffers a £44 million loss as a result of the pass. There is no additional services provided by staff or their partners, uh, nominees having passes. In fact, this uh, system has been in place since 2002 including throughout the entire eight years of the previous mayor being uh, mayor. So if, as you're suggesting, uh, the staff nominee pass was to be withdrawn, there would be absolutely zero savings to TfL because we wouldn't be able to reduce services because of the reductions in nominees using uh, their passes. Well, I don't think that's right, because surely if those people with free passes need to get from A to B, then uh, they will, if they can't use a free pass, surely they would then buy a ticket. Well, that's an assumption you're making, not I'm making. The fact that there is, is that no additional services are provided uh, for nominees having a uh, pass. You're surmising uh, that if a pass was taken away, and by the way, it's a term of the uh, contract, so you'd have to replace this unilateral change you're suggesting with something else, query the value of the something else, because you will know as well as I do basic employment law, which is you can't unilaterally withdraw uh, conditions on a contract if it was so easy then the previous mayor would have done so during the eight years he had as chair of TfL. I think you're worrying me quite a bit here, Mr Mayor. You're missing the point. If people get free uh, transport and haven't got the ability to get free transport anymore and wish to use that transport, they will have to buy a ticket. So um, I, I, I do worry when we're looking at budgets that you don't understand that. But I'll move on. Um, I think I uh, you are. I member... you're going to move on. Pardon? I bet you're going to move on. Shall we move on to B, and that's Tony Devonish, Assemblymember. Devonish, would you like to ask the next question, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Good morning, uh, Mr Mayor and team. Um, and I, I could have quite a, quite a brief answer, because it's a very long question. I expect we could go on the whole two hours. So just please give me a very brief answer on the three scenarios. What is the basis of the budgetary assumptions behind the COVID-19 for 2020-21 in terms of the GLA uh, group income for each of the scenarios, please. Let's start out in the budget guidance. Was that short enough? 
That was very, that was very short. I'll, actually, I'm going to let my colleagues come back on that later because I've got some uh, questions I'd love to ask. So I'm going to go on to C. Um, your guidance talks to efficiencies from the group-wide collaboration at scale uh, for these savings and efficiencies. So I have five specific points for you, Mr. Mayor, and they're all things I've done in the past, particularly during my uh, 15 years on Westminster Council. Um, so they could all be done if you wish to, and they are meant to be uh, cross-party questions. I'm not trying to score any political points of these, Mr. Mayor. And I'll start by saying I actually agree with you for once on your plan to potentially move out of City Hall, because I think we need to look at all options to safeguard frontline services. So on City Hall, Mr. Mayor, can I ask you if a public or private sector landlord came to you with another um, option, uh, would you consider it? Uh, T Tony, we're doing the whole thing on the crystal later. If oh, you sorry. want to answer that, Mr. Mayor, fine, but we are we have got a section on that. Apologies, sorry, I missed that. Well, do you want to come in on that question afterwards? Do you do you want to go? Do you want to ask, ask anything? Our ones then. The are ones aren't on the list. Um, well. In terms of more general procurement uh, savings, then, Mr. Mayor, will you consider putting out to OJU and publicising widely to other public sector? third sector and businesses asking for executive summaries on cases to drive GLA income or efficiencies to protect frontline public services? So I'm not sure I understand the question. The question is, will you ask the market basically how you can save money rather than just coming up with your, with your own suggestions? Well, we always speak to uh, people inside and outside the organisation about ideas. It's not a new thing. We're always, we're always going to carry on doing so. OK, thank you. Will you consider conducting a forensic audit of all the GLA budgets, an independent audit, to identify line by budget line how to save money? I'm, I'm not sure if I can justify asking outside people to do what uh, our excellent Executive Director of Resources and his team do, along with other staff at GLA. I've got confidence in our staff. If you want us to spend a huge amount of money bringing in outside consultants, uh, then we could look into your proposal, including the cost of that. Okay. Will you consider an integrated estates and back office strategy for the blue light services, potentially merging the MET, the LFB and the LAS estate and back offices to potentially drive tens of millions of pounds of savings to protect frontline services? Yeah, this is something we've been looking into, Tony, since I became mayor in 2016. And uh, a group uh, collaboration uh, is, uh, group is chaired by my chief of staff, David Bellamy, uh, and David can come in if you want him to, to give you some examples of the savings already made. Uh, for example, in TfL, a huge amount of money has been saved on accommodation going down, and one of the proposals we have is taking over a floor at Palestra. You'll be where we're currently using space in Union Street, but I'm happy to bring in David Bellamy to give you some examples of some of the monies we've uh, saved in this area already, and some of the work we're doing going forward as well. I'm happy for David to write to me on that to save, uh, save time, Chair. Thank you for that. Um, will you consider selling off or joint venture in Europe's largest regeneration site, Old Oak, to raise hundreds of millions of pounds to protect frontline services? Well, I'm happy again, Tony, if you to speak to um, uh, OPDC about any ideas you've got in relation to uh, OPDC and uh, savings we can make going forward. You'll be aware of the huge potential of that uh, site and the downside of JVs in relation to what we can keep in relation to taxpayers and where the proceeds uh, go. But I'm more than happy again for you to speak to the OPDC team or any ideas that you've got going forward. Thank you. Now, going back to the specific questions I've been asked to ask by the, uh, by the team, what are the main areas of consolidation that you are looking at in terms of savings and efficiencies? Yeah, I mean, again, it's something that both David Galley and David Bobby can, can explain to you, but we're doing a number of pieces of work in relation to collaboration and uh, consolidation uh, going uh, forward. We really have made some consolidations in some areas. I mentioned uh, property in relation to TfL, but there are other things we're looking into. But again, one of the reasons for the consultation for the uh, repurpose of the budget in 2021, in advance of 2022, is to look at areas where we can consolidate. Okay, uh, uh, Tony, I think you've gone into D, which actually was Lens. No, uh, I haven't. I'm still reading from some C, C1, actually, but apologies if I haven't been clear, Chair. Um, so my C1 is, what are the main areas which Mr Khan is, has answered? C2 is, what is the total level of, ex 
level of expenditure in these areas, please? Sorry, which areas? In the areas of group-wide collaboration in terms of savings and efficiency targets. I Sorry, I can't hear you, Caroline. I, th I think Carol Caroline's looking um, perplexed, as indeed I am, uh, uh, Assemblymember Devonish. You've, you've come in on the wrong question. Um, if I so I'm, read I'm reading from the script. This is the problem. No. I'm reading from the script that was sent to me. Uh, <laughs> you've, you've gone into D. So um, apologies. Uh, okay, going. If we can just ask a little bit more around B. So I will do that. Um, Mr. Mayor, between the three scenarios, the potential impact on some bodies varies much more than others, particularly TfL, who barely take any hit at all under scenario one. Can you tell me why that is the case? I'm not sure that's right, actually, Chair. Let me just get to these scenarios. Sure. Uh, can, I, can I help with that, Chair? Um, the, the, the thing about the three scenarios is that they reflect different patterns about what happens with business rate income. Yeah, I thought you'd say that. And, yeah, and the, the situation with TfL is, you know, in the Mayor's consideration in terms of savings targets for TfL, is obviously TfL takes over three quarters of the business rates that the Mayor receives. And so, yeah. If there's a significant fall in business rates, that can't but you know result in consequences for TfL. Um, on the other hand, scenario one is a scenario which says there's no fall in business rates. Um, I don't think that's you know, a particularly plausible scenario, but it's it's you know it's one one option that we illustrate. And what we sh it shows in that situation is the mayor's view that it would be inappropriate for TfL to cross-subsidise other areas at a time when TfL is having to receive funding from the Department for Transport, given the very significant loss in fares income that we're facing. And so all three scenarios have been set on the basis that whatever the fall in business rate income that actually occurs, with TfL bears its proportionate share of that. And then you know, we look at we look at the balance with the rest of the GLA group organisations. OK. I mean, Mr Mayor, you have said on numerous occasions that TfL is flabby, and you repeated this at the MQT last month. Um, I assume they won't stop being flabby. You're taking that into account on your um, when you're looking at these scenarios, are you? Again, I think you're in danger of misleading the committee. I said no, the, you the keep saying that, flabby. and I'm not. I think TfL, I said a number, on a number of occasions uh, that TfL was flabby when I was running to be mayor and that I'd uh, make it efficient and lose some of the fat. And we've made huge savings from reducing operating deficit by more than 71%, from increasing cash balances by 16%, from reducing the amount of uh, agency staff by more than 58%, by reducing the amount of other staff by 12%, by freezing the salaries of all those above 100k uh, in the packages they had. Uh, by other savings we've made. So I've already got rid of some of the, the flag that I talked about, including reducing the amount of accommodation uh, used by TfL staff, merging engineering, uh, and so forth. We've made a huge amount of efficiency savings, what I would call removing the fat, over the last uh, four years. But there's always a, a further savings we can make, and we'll continue to look for any areas where we can make savings. OK, I'm just repeating that you said they were flabby. But we'll move on. Uh, Len Deval. Thank you, uh, Chair. Look, uh, I think this budget before us and we're planning for is probably the most difficult budget we faced in the entire history of the GLA. And it's difficult when we talk in technical terms to get across what it means for services and people and jobs. And it's quite clear people will lose their jobs after this budget. I want to go back to one area which has always been seen in previous administrations as a bit of an holy grail, shared services, or what you, I think, describe in your budget guidance as um, uh, consolidated efficiencies in the group-wide collaboration. And I want to just go back. I think Tony Devnish tried to ask these questions, but I think we need some answers to it. So I don't mind who wants to come in and tell us this. So what are the main areas of consolidation shared services are you looking at? 
Sh shall I take that Assembly member? Um, the the main, uh, it's first obviously is important to note that there are a large number of shared services in place around the group already, but that's something we want to build on. Um, the group collaboration board is running a process to review um, basically all areas that are either what you might regard as back office functions, but also we're going to look at all areas that you could kind of regard as policy or service delivery, maybe some of the more kind of middle office areas as well, and look for you know, overlaps and look for um, you know, areas that we would get material savings if we were to make a change. That means we're already looking at a number of things. Um, there are things looked at around some of our HR systems and whether aspects of that um, at the GLA and some of the functional bodies could be consolidated into TFL. Um, there are some discussions about IT um, and there are a range of um, other things there. We're looking to extend um, procurement. We have a collaborative procurement team already and we're asking if that can take on more categories, more areas of indirect spend that are things that are not specific to one particular organisation and so work is moving forward on that and we have and I think this touches on one of the points Assemblymember Devonish raised also been looking at office accommodation strategy as the Mayor says you know, TFL have um, made significant savings but we're looking to take you know, a group wide approach to that um, so we, we'll do that and yeah, yeah really a range of areas we're looking to move through can I just um, interrupt? Look, um, everything you've just told me is not new. Since 2000, these discussions have been underway and there. My primary concern is the, I think, and, and you know, if the Assembly is still of the same mind, I think, would be very supportive of this d direction of travel, albeit against a difficult background around why we're doing it, because there should be more efficiencies in shared services across the GLA group. It makes sense, it always has made sense in 2000, but there's various barriers to it. The time to do this is not on your side to deliver the savings. And I do think you're over it in your budget strategy in terms of the savings. So can you tell me what's the total level of expenditure in these areas and what is your expectance of around potential savings they can contribute in terms of next year's budget? David so, Gally. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Len. Um, I haven't got the figures in front of me on exactly what the group level of, say, HR, IT, the other issues that uh, David Bellamy has, has mentioned to, to hand. We're obviously happy to supply those across the group. But what I would add is that we are looking at new areas in some of the uh, things that David's mentioned. One of the things that I particularly think is productive and I think will generate uh, some fairly immediate savings would be around energy procurement. One of the things we're looking at with our colleagues, particularly in TFL, are whether we can actually uh, look at a energy procurement across the group, not just within TFL, but obviously other functional bodies piggybacking on that and looking at the extent also that could actually boost the green agenda. Um, so there are, I think, uh, areas where we will anticipate there would be contributions to the ambitious savings targets that we've set from work that you know has perhaps been characterised as uh, existing work streams. OK, and so um, on levels of savings that you're anticipating, what, what's, what, what, what do they look like? What will you, what's your, as a treasurer, the old fashioned term, if I can call it that, what is your advice to the mayor of the potential savings that you'd be looking at if you can deliver this reorganisation, because it's like a mini reorganisation of, um, of these services for next year's budget? Um, Len, as I think your question um, sets out, um, we need to be very careful about the time frame of some of the projects. Um, and clearly the levels of rationalisation on some back office functions will take time. Um, we also need to be very careful around 
you know, doing this too bluntly, which actually could put um, efficiencies back. So I think we need to be um, reasonably pessimistic, sceptical around the extent to which, um, say, HR uh, and IT savings can generate savings quickly. Uh, and many of the uh, improvements I think we can see from, say, the back office functions will be around the generation of, of better working between parts of the group rather than there will be large cashable savings. But we obviously need to explore this. But my perception, I think, is that um, the GLA and GLA group as a whole has been behind compared with our uh, colleagues in the boroughs around looking at exploring the, these options, but also looking to learn some of the lessons, hard won lessons in the boroughs around what can actually work on some of the, the areas that uh, we think are, are productive. So in the spirit of transparency, in terms of the outcome of the budget, we're not going to see staff moved out the GLA budget and, and that taken as a saving because the GLA budget would have reduced. So let's put it bluntly. You move X staff to TFL, say, because it's where the shared services is based, and then you reduce your budget in the GLA and you claim that, isn't that wonderful and fantastic? when really it doesn't really contribute to next year's budget, but over a number of years will contribute to efficiency and potential savings. How are you going to show that in a transparent way that they are genuine savings as we move towards it? I take all into account. It is a difficult one. I think it's an important one, and I'm pleased the mayor is backing it and getting on with it in that sense, but it does take time. But Actually, in the savings, in the scheme of the savings, it's not the only growl. It, it doesn't, doesn't take away from the difficult decisions that need to be made during this budget. And I want to know how you're going to treat it, because I want to understand what is happening to our organisations, and are they genuine savings, or are they longer-term savings? Yeah, you, Glenn, as always, your questions are, are excellent ones. Um, very much so. We want to take a group-wide perspective, and I think the, the Mayor's City Hall proposal is perhaps a good instance of this. So we're looking at you know the perspective across the group rather than the incidence of where the GLA would save money by the proposed City Hall move as against the others. So we need to be very, very clear across the group and look at the group-wide perspective here rather than uh, playing shops between the various functional bodies. So as part of the, the work we'll do in putting the budget proposals together um, you know, by the end of November, we're very clear on where we will be looking at moving um, mm -hmm. costs between functional bodies so we can isolate the overall group-wide benefits. I think the example of the proposal on City Hall you know, is, is a good precedent for how we'd look to approach um, what will be obviously a, a difficult, complex issue. Well, I'm glad you're looking at the group group wide issue because I hope you're also going to look at the savings that you're asking the London Assembly to make compared to your other parts of the GLA. You're not treating us fairly, but my colleagues will be asking some further questions about that. And I think, you know, we need a very robust, um, well, we started to have a an exchange outside this meeting, but actually I think we need some proper thinking about what is fair across the GLA group in terms of savings that are required from individual components of it. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Caroline Pigeon. Thank you very much. Um, across the GLA group, you're looking at um, significant savings, and some of those are likely to be in the year, this financial year. Can I just clarify, has there been a recruitment freeze put in place, given as Assembly Member Duval has said, we're looking at some potentially redundancies right across the group? I'm happy for uh, David Bellamy to come in, but the short answer is yeah. I mean, any vacancies are advertised internally, uh, not externally, unless there are exceptional reasons. David, do you want to just answer Caroline's questions, please? Yeah. So in the budget guidance, the mayor asked each organisation to think about recruitment freeze, and obviously it's you know it's about each organisation's um, circumstances, and obviously it's important to remember that you know, each organisation is not just full of colleagues performing one particular role. There are there are specialist skills um, that will be needed, and so sometimes you know, with the best will in the world. You might you obviously you might be looking ideally 
to move people around internally, but when you need specialist skills, you've got no alternative but to recruit externally for them if you don't have somebody internally. And so we're not looking at a blanket recruitment freeze, but you know, clearly all chief officers around the group are very mindful of the situation and you know, we'll only be proceeding with recruit, external recruitment where they're, they're confident it's the right thing to do. Okay, do you feel, I'm looking at the um, London website at the moment, do you feel it's appropriate, given the financial pressure we're under, to be advertising a private secretary to the chief executive officer of MOPAC on a salary of £67,000 to £75,000, far more than a police officer gets? Do you feel that's appropriate at this moment? And there may well be other very good PAs in other parts of the GLA group who could go and fulfil this role and probably for a lower salary. Um, to be to be clear, that that is not a PA role. The um, it is a role that is you know, very very significantly ab above that. It's a you know it's a, it's actually a very senior role, and that is reflected as you know salaries are set on the basis at MOPAC as at the GLA on the basis of the job description and the independent process that generates that the 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 grade and the salary and that the salary there is reflective of the responsibilities of of that role and i know that you know, that role has been identified as absolutely needed and there have been other roles that are now not being filled in order to enable that it just feels to me that across the organisation we're facing real pressures and, and as Assemblymember Duval says, you know, this is something we've not faced probably at the GLA before and it feels to me a really inflated role to be advertised at this time and um, I would hope that MOPAC and others will um, reconsider what roles they see as essential rather than those which are, are potentially nice to have. I'll leave it there, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Would you like to come in with your other questions now? Uh, was, hasn't Len also got the next one to do? Or has that been done? Um, he, he signed off and finished. I'd assumed he had finished. Len? So, um, Chair, that, that was me. Um, I think on um, it's just a fairly straightforward forward question. Uh, I think it's either to David Bellamy or David Gully. We are now in the third of the way through 2021. The profile of savings in scenarios one and two appear to have a limited recognition of the time taken to deliver the savings, but in scenario three, it does. Can you just explain the rationale behind that? Why is this? Or have I misread so, it? So, I misunderstood it. So, what the savings targets show is the expected loss of income in those in those situations. And obviously, they, they, they will differ based because they're both around assumptions, uh, yeah, around different scenarios for business rates. And um, the scenario three shows a smaller saving this year based on, in part, on some of the help the government's provided to the hospitality sector, etc., with their business rates. So the savings targets just set out the gap that's to be breached. You make a very good point, Assembly Member, about you know, we are a number of months into the year. Um, we know the government in its announcement last week said they may provide more help for this year, but only following the spending review, which realistically means December, you know, when clearly we'll be three quarters of the way through the financial year. And so until then, the actual savings you know, target that you know, absolutely would be required driven by loss of income is going to be unknown. So the question is, how do we na navigate that uncertainty? Um, we have the government's announcement last week, obviously since the budget guidance was published, that said that losses this year could be repaid over three years rather than all having to be repaid next year. So yeah, that doesn't, it, to my mind, mean that we could just carry on regardless this year, because obviously the savings target scenario three shows, which is our best expectation at the moment for next year, is very, very large. And trying to put savings from this year on top of that would make a very, very difficult budget for us to set in, in the months ahead. But nevertheless, it and the reserves the mayor's prudently built up 
give us some options to work with each organisation and decide, well, what is the right level of savings to deliver in year, given the uncertainties, given where each organisation is at in terms of contractual commitments and so forth, and you know, where is it more appropriate to try and manage the situation over the longer term. And that begs the question then, um, really, and it, I don't think, I think you're caught in a trap about previous budget processes. Shouldn't we be looking at a, probably a three-year budget process with indicative worst-case scenarios for years two and three? Mm. That would enable you to then plan, even if it was flexible, but allow some of the components of the budget, the services like whether it's police or TfL, um, to plan accordingly around that. I think they do do that to a degree at their level. What we've never seen implicitly at any GLA process is that longer-term planning scenario that you've outlined to me, but explicit. The explicit knowing that actually if X and Y happens in years two, then that's where we're going to go and that's our plan for it. And in year three, it becomes a bit more difficult because the uncertainties, and of course, government doesn't help in terms of its grant regimes or uh, planning in terms of that way forward. Isn't that where we should be going in terms of this budget in a much more clear, clearer, explicit way? I know it crosses an election, which is always difficult, but mayors, if there was a change in mayoralty, which I don't think there will be, if there was then that can be adapted and it can be changed. Do you know what I mean? Because it's indicative. Mm -hmm. It just sets out a plan of travel of where this organisation is going. At the scenario, uh, scenario is based on where we are at the moment. I think, Senator Member, you make, you make a good point. And we, we try, obviously, to set out um, a four-year view in the group budget every year. I think we all accept that future years, as, as you look further into the future, there are more uncertainties. And... Yeah, where those uncertainties are really tangible material, we try and document them in, in, in the budget documents. The problem I think we face here is that the uncertainty is really all, all enveloping. So, as you say, we don't know what council tax and business rate income we're going to get this year. We don't know what assistance the government is going to provide for that um, until after the spending review, so probably December. Um, because there's a spending review and there's no multi-year settlement in place, we have no view on what um, baselines and funding expectations the government is going to set for 21-22. We don't know what the council tax referendum thresholds will be. We don't know how many of the government's additional police officers they're, they're proposing to provide funding for for the, for the next or future financial years. We don't know whether the government will continue as they should to provide um, the £21 million that their pensions changes cost the London Fire Brigade every year. We, yeah, we don't know um, what will come out of the government review of business rates, either you know, will that still be used to fund local government at all or not? If they do, will they make the change about when business rate growth will proceed? Um, yeah, we don't know what the impact on the London economy will be of the current negotiations with the European Union. Um, and yeah, we have, given the economic uncertainty, the professional advice I have is that we can have absolutely no certainty or you know, no reasonable estimate of how much income we'll receive from tax after March 22. And I apologise, I've probably missed a few of the uncertainties there. Yeah, yeah, it is difficult enough setting out where we're going to be this year. Next year is, is very, very difficult. Beyond that, it's impossible. And yeah, when we're, yeah, we're dealing with things like yeah, LLDC, very major long-term investment plans, TfL, clearly huge long-term investment that you want to deliver, and you just have absolutely no certainty at all. It just is um, it's a very, very difficult environment in which to which to plan and move forward. Um, you know, I've heard all that and, and I agree with you. It is difficult, but there are some assumptions that can be made, key assumptions that can enable you to have a longer term plan. And, you know, as I said, it needs to be flexible and it needs to change. 
Indeed, this year's plan is a plan, but it will change. It will change. You know, your council tax assessments is one thing which I think I'm not worried about. They come in, it might be delayed. I am worried about business rates issue, which should be the primary concern of this budget and about its impact about uh, in terms of our, our delivery of some of those services. But equally, you know, the two difficult box should not stop us planning over the next two years. And I think, I think two to three years, I think you're totally right, it then gets a bit crazy. But there are assumptions that can be made, but if you're flexible enough, then you adapt. And if you're clear enough with when you're planning those issues, people know it will change. It just seems to me that we need to give a direction of travel for the GLA group over these difficult times mm -hmm. So it can deliver its best possible services within a reduced envelope. It's not going to be the same. It's not going to be the same. Chair, I I'll leave it there. Thank you. OK, thank you. Before I bring in Assembly Member Pigeon, can, can I just ask a question of David Dem uh, Bellamy? You're assuming a loss of council tax at around 7%. Is that right? Yes. I just wonder where you've got that from. Harrow are assuming uh, 1% to 2%. So where, Chair, where are you David, getting... Probably... Chair, would, it, would it help if David Ganni came in? Because David Ganni has been speaking to the local councils and the treasurers and the Director of Finance. That may help, Chair, in relation to how we've arrived at this estimate. David Ganni. Um, Chair, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so what we've assumed is the median average, mean average, sorry, of the returns that the, the borough treasurers in London have made. So, Chair, you're absolutely right. Some authorities, like, like your own in Harrow, have assumed really small losses. Others uh, in, in inner London have assumed much larger losses. So the 7% is best on, based on best information we have from directors of finance on average. Um, but clearly that 7% is by no means a worst case scenario. It's early days for boroughs on their collection numbers and the uh, recovery actions that they're beginning to start to put in place. So obviously we monitor that very closely, but 7% feels like the best assumption that we could make on the best information we have available at the moment. OK, I mean, it endorses what uh, Assemblymember Duval is saying, that things will change and change. And we do understand how difficult it is, I, I do assure you. Uh, so we'll go on to the next question, please, with Assemblymember Pigeon. Thank you very much. Um, earlier, you were talking about Transport for London bearing uh, its proportionate share, if you like. But what is the logic, when we've looked at this, behind the, it feels like an extensive burden being placed on TfL to cover the funding gap when it is so dependent on emergency government funding? Sorry, are you, the, as, as I said, tried to explain earlier, the, the three different scenarios all set out TfL um, receiving you know, a proportionate reduction in business rate income, strictly proportionate approach. The reality is that TfL receives over three quarters of mayoral business rates. Mm. Yeah? And so if you try and you know, exempt or significantly reduce the impact on TfL, well, the consequent impact there on other organisations is is huge. Um, you know, the, the, yeah, the numbers in, yeah, the numbers involved, you just cannot um, re, yeah, leave that rubber reduction. So if you take in, say, two, if you say, oh, let's not take £200 million pounds out of um, TfL next year, £212 million, pounds, well, yeah, that's easily half the budget of the fire brigade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you when you look at it in in that light you can you can realize that it's not it's not possible for these other services essentially overwhelmingly police and fire as the other big organizations in the gla group to um to cross subsidize tfl because there are there are emergency services that londoners absolutely rely on and as we know from yeah, all the um, savings that the Met has had to make over the last um, you know, seven, eight years or so. Um, I think we're up in the high 800 millions now, and from fire station closures, etc. That you know, any material um, further savings you know, have a real risk to the front line. Okay, so you're hoping that in your next round of negotiation with government for the next uh, phase of funding for TfL, that they will help cover this huge funding shortfall at TfL? 
Well, that that's why the mayor is, is very carefully not expecting TfL to meet more than their share of the loss and not expecting them to meet less. The reality is that this fall in business rate is impacting across local government and you know, so you know, it will affect all authorities and you know, the government has to take a policy decision on national basis about what, if anything, it wishes to do about that and then you know, the consequences of that flow through to TfL and the DFT just in the same way as the consequences flow through to some of the other local authorities in the country who run aspects of public transport network. Thank you. And in, t in TfL's business plan, all the mayoral funding is allocated to its capital programme. What are the main areas that you're expecting TfL to look at to achieve the level of savings set out in scenarios two and three? So um, TfL's emergency budget that's in operation at the moment, um, um, all, this, all the business rates income is being spent on operational matters with um, capital investment funded either through borrowing or through um, additional ring fence income sources for particular projects. And so obviously um, it's a matter for the negotiations with the government in terms of a, how um, we set a TfL budget for the second half of the financial year and then the budget for TfL next year in terms of you know, what support is available, what options there are, and thus you know, what mayoral business rates can be allocated to. And in terms of TfL's capital programme, clearly programmes are at risk. Which capital projects do you expect to to be cancelled um, in the coming year if the funding isn't there? We're, not, we're absolutely not talking about cancellation at this stage. Um, it's about keep it, keeping going the projects that are going and then trying to get to a long-term funding model that allows us to keep a safe, reliable transport network in London and also make the investment that's needed um, to grow that. And so that's, you know, the capacity to do that is, is clearly um, necessary. Uh, we saw the Prime Minister yesterday in Goul, um, where a train factory is being built as a direct result of London's ability to invest in Piccadilly Line rolling stock, spreading money around the country. And that obviously is, is great to see and is an example of how, um, you know, our ability to invest in London's public transport network doesn't just be benefit London, it benefits the whole country. And so we, um, you know, the government, clearly as the Prime Minister was there yesterday, can see that and we'll be continuing to discuss that and make the case in the negotiations ahead. Yeah, I mean, I understand with projects that you're already committed to, you're on site, you're part way through, of course, but there'll be other projects, I don't know, Bakerloo Line extension, fantastic project, things like that. Obviously, the signalling upgrade to the Piccadilly Line, I've heard, um, I've heard rumours that the Prime Minister is saying that a condition of your next um, bailout, if I can put it like that, would be you'd have to have driverless trains. Well, unless you've got the, uh, not just the new trains with the capability of that, but also the new signalling, then that's not a possibility and it's not even in the budget. So are you expecting some of those um, uh, projects that aren't committed to yet, that you perhaps hadn't got the full funding package for, but are so needed for London to be sort of pushed back further? Perhaps Mr. Mayor might want to answer that. Yeah, that's, that's one of your questions. I think the short answer to your question is, is those uh, capital projects for which we are contractually obliged to follow through, we're going to follow through. Those that are quite a long way down, of course, will follow through. But those that are planned, but either not co contractually committed or not a funding source, you're right to suggest will be paused. So you're right, Piccadilly signaling is, is a good example. We need it. It would increase the frequency of trains. Uh, even with Heathrow as it is now, forget a new runway uh, three, uh, would increase capacity hugely. Uh, and so we need that. That's paused. Uh, Hammersmith Bridge is another example. I know Tony Devonish is, uh, as a local uh, single member, is, is quite keen about this. Uh, that is planned without government support. That is paused. You, you, you and I have discussed in the past the Sutton Coyd and Tram extension. That is planned. That is paused. Bakerloo Line extension south, good example of a project planned. Uh, there's the issues there about planning and uh, we want to protect uh, some of the sites that, that we can't do the work there we'd like to do. You'll be aware of my frustration about the various 
uh, strategic ally business cases are at Crossroad too. Uh, still <laughs> waiting for the green light there. So those are some examples, Caroline, of things that we want to do. We've done lots of work on them. Uh, uh, one that's personal to you is the, um, the replacement for the Canary uh, uh, rather high cycling, Canary North for the, the cycling bridge, the ferry uh, uh, replacement because of the increasing cost. Another example is planned. And so those are examples of things we want to do. Uh, but clearly we can't until we've resolved the issue of, uh, of finances. But things like Northern Line Extension, Bank, um, you know, those are still going ahead. Uh, UNES Extension is still going ahead. Street Space is still going ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Um, next up is Umesh Desai, Assembly Member. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I want to ask you uh, questions about uh, MOPEC, the Mayor's Office and Police Against Crime. But can I say at the outset, I'm going to put some figures to you, but I, I know you'll agree with me about this, that to the average ordinary Londoner out there, figures don't mean anything. What they want to know is, you know, what the reality behind the figures and how are you going to keep London and Londoners uh, safe. Now, I know you're committed to keeping London safe, but also you have a difficult financial situation. Um, so in light of that, I mean, MOPEC already has a funding gap of um, 293 million pounds in 2021 stroke 22. Uh, are your saving targets for MOPEC in addition to the savings required to plug this gap? And in light, in light of this, uh, this situation, will you be able to maintain officer numbers at the levels committed to in your budget of 2020-21? Yeah, uh, that's your question. Thanks for your comments. So, so this park was in the park the individual numbers for the reasons you said that, that Londoners uh, get bombarded with numbers. So the short answer is, uh, in all scenarios, there is a reduction in uh, the monies that were coming in that we use for policing. You'll be aware, Omesh, over the last uh, three, four years, I've invested the maximum I can from City Hall through council tax and business rates in the region of two hundred and thirty million pounds. In addition, funding to the police from us. We've had to make in the, in the police over the last 10 years more than 850 million pounds worth of savings. And you're right, there are still more savings required to be made because of the austerity from 2010. So what we're announcing uh, in the budget guidance is on top of those savings that the police have to make because of austerity from 2010 going forward. And so that's why I talk about a new era of austerity. This is not um, gonna be, I'm afraid, a replacement force as well as uh, the savings the police uh, have to make. But the good news is because of our investment from uh, City Hall to twinned with, twinned with the announcement from the Prime Minister in relation to Home Office funding, we now have in London more than 32,400 officers. That's the largest we've had for some time now. What we can't do with Frederick Mersh is increase that further uh, to, the to the levels we want up until we have some more information from the government about what, what more additional money we're getting for years two and three. Thank you, Mr. Bear. In fact, I think um, Mr. De uh, Bellamy actually talked about the unknown situation in terms of how much funding we are going to get uh, from the government for police officers, the extra officers that we all want. So over the last decade, we know that the government imposed a billion pounds of cuts on the bat. What level of extra funding uh, uh, does the government need to provide for the Met to cover the cost of the crisis if it isn't simply to continue the damage caused uh, by uh, by its pre predecessors over the last 10 years? Well, there's, there's some short-term specific things the government can do. So because of COVID, the Met Police has spent an additional £17 million. Pounds. We'd like that back from the uh, government. Uh, we were supposed to be getting £11 million pounds through a special grant for policing, Trump's visit, for policing the Extinction Rebellion protests, etc. The government has not given us that special grant, £11 million. Pounds. And you'd also be aware of the most because of your lobbying. We're also £159 million pounds short of the National International Capital Cities grant, which we're also losing out. So those are three specific items that we need. But also we need, uh, as soon as possible, information about how many more offices and money we're going to receive for 21, 22 and 22, 23. We all be aware, we think we're entitled to 6,000 offices. We've been given funding for 1,369. We need to know as soon as possible years two and three because that has an impact on our planning going forward. I'm glad you mentioned the National and International Capital City Grant. Um, for Londoners who are listening in, the Met has extra responsibilities 
you know, countering terrorism, providing advice to other forces, protecting royalty and other public figures, uh, and some considerable sums here that we are talking about here, for which the government really should fund the MAT. Um, so, and we will carry on the lobby, of course. Mr. Mayor, a couple of final questions. Are there any other measures that you think can tell us that are being considered by MOPAC to help fund uh, the gap and protect police officer uh, numbers? And in particular, uh, what uh, thinking is being given to reshaping the MAT state strategy? So the last I knew was that um, the MAT was reviewing the strategy in light of extra, uh, uh, in, in light of extra officers. Uh, where are we with this? Um, there's still a large number of empty police, uh, vacant police buildings. Uh, are they still up for sale? Uh, will selling them uh, help, uh, you know, with, your, with the financial situation? Thanks. Well, firstly, I mean, two answers. One is, I think Len Deval referred to some of this in relation to uh, whether you call it consolidation, shared services or whatever. We need to do more of that in relation to the NPS going forward. And that may bring up some savings uh, going uh, forward. Good example is Hounslow's new town hall has a space reserved for police officers. They're working together there. Good example of sharing uh, of uh, facilities. In relation to the state strategy, that is still currently on pause because you're right, the additional police officers uh, that we've now got coming into the NPS require additional estate space. Uh, places, not simply police stations open to the public, but places for them to rest, recuperate, do their notes, uh, lock up facilities, new vehicles we need for the police. So the, the selling off, sort of in, in, in shorthand term, the selling off of police buildings is paused, except for the ones that are definitely not fit for purpose uh, under any scenario. Those will carry on, and I think Sophie Lynn has shared those with you, that what those are. The, the other ones that were earmarked for selling off have been paused until we've got some more certainty about police numbers in 2021, 2022, and 2023. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, before I go on to the next question, Mr. Mayor, how many police officers do we have actually at the moment? It's just north of 32,400. I can give you the exact number, Susan. I don't know. It changes. Yeah, that's fair enough. I can send that to you. Yeah, no, that, that's a fair enough answer. How, how many are you aiming to make sure you've got by the end of this financial year, even if it means you have to take funding from other areas? What are you aiming for? I think at the moment, uh, it looks like under the scenarios, 32,400. We provided, I provided money for 1,000 additional officers, you'll be worth £59 million pounds times two, which is in the reserves. Uh, until we've got some more certainty around uh, uh, our monies, and I think David will, will come in to explain what I mean by this, where we, uh, the, the, rec the recruitment uh, is currently, uh, we've got more people coming in, but any new recruitment will be paused in the short term unless we know a bit more about our finances. But I'll let David explain uh, when we can, when we can uh, accelerate the recruitment. Yeah. So the committee will remember that in the, the group budget, um, as well as the Home Office funding, um, which should bring us on top of the Mayor's previous funding to 32,400 officers. Um, the Mayor also provided funding to um, bring forward 600 of the officers that we have assumed that the Home Office will fund the recruitment of next year and actually begin their recruitment in the second half of this year. And so what we're actually seeing is because um, yeah, the Met is at, yeah, the, the, the budget was based on the assumption of being at 32,400 officers for the end of September, and then adding those 600 across the second half of the year. What, what in fact we've seen is we got to 32,400 um, by the end of May, due to some excellent work by the Met on recruitment, um, not, you know, they managed to manage this through despite the impact of COVID. And also it's fair to say there are fewer officers choosing to retire at the moment because they're clearly wanting to stay and, and be part of the response. So what in fact is happening is that additional funding that the Mayor provided is being used to keep us at 32,400 now rather than to you know, what was planned, where we planned that right now we would be at a lower level of officers and gradually build up to 32,400. Okay. Just to reassure each, uh, I've written to the Home Secretary to support us going forward to have more officers. 
Good. We all support more officers, Mr Mayor, absolutely. And, and within that, you'll use the £180 million you've got in reserve to protect the numbers. Yeah? Yeah, as David said, because we've, we, because we've got to 32400 sooner, we don't want to go below that now. And so, correct. So you'll be using those reserves for that? Good. Well, that's good news for Londoners, Mr Mayor. Thank you for that. We like to see our police officers on our streets. Um, <clears throat> so now I will ask you, please, how do you, this is to the Mayor, how do you justify the London Assembly's saving target being proportionately so much greater than the rest of the group at a time when its work is much more important than it has been? Yeah, again, I'm not sure if the, the premise of your question is right. Maybe David Gandhi can explain why I think you may uh, inadvertently got that wrong in relation to the GLA mayor savings versus the assembly ones. Uh, David, you can just respond in relation to the point made by the chair. Yep, thank you, Mayor. Um, so if we look, for instance, at scenario three, the GLA assembly savings are 11% in this financial year, 17% in 21-22. Uh, and that does, uh, is obviously higher than the uh, percentages across the whole group of 5% in this year and 10% in, in next year. However, they are lower than the GLA mayor percentage totals of 14% and 22%. And that reflects you know, a deliberate choice that the mayor has made in looking to increase the burden, not only of um, the savings upon uh, the GLA as a whole and the MDCs, but also to put the, the most the, the, the highest target on the GLA mayor so that the assembly's savings targets are roughly 20% lower than the GLA mayor's total on that scenario. Yes, but it, I, I think of it as being slightly disingenuous because this is all around discretionary mayoral funding, isn't it? That's the basis because your February budget set the GLA mayor revenue budget at 800, uh, 843 million compared to the Assembly's 8.4 million budget. So essentially your whole budget is 100 times larger. Now I understand that portions of your budget are ring fence, um, but you know there are economies of scale and do you concede that it, it is much harder for smaller budgets and directorates to absorb similar levels of savings than it is for a much larger one? Yeah, um, maybe I should answer that, Chair. I well, it is it is right to say that smaller organisations have um, have less flexibility. You can balance that against um, you know in the mayor's budget there've been a number of things even in the discretionary areas that are funded out of the council tax and business rates that we've lost where the mayor has you know, has no control over what it costs. As we know, the city hall rent and business rates are, are fixed. As we know. Um, the Microsoft licenses that we're using to conduct this meeting um, are, are fixed. Um, and yeah, we, we know that yeah, the elections budget is outside the, mayor, the mayor's control and is a matter for the returning officer, but the mayor just has to meet it. And so, yes, the mayor has some flexibility, but also some big items that can't be changed. And the fundamental, the fundamental point is that the, the GLA mayor budget is funded by council tax, by business rates, and by ring-fenced funding from third parties. And so it is not possible to spend the £311 million pounds of adult education funding. You can't spend any of that on anything else, you know, even if you wanted to. It is ring-fenced and can only be spent on that. And so it, so it goes on for all the different so sorts of money that we bring in. Where things are... Yeah, in going, going through the budget exercise I've been doing with GLA Mayor over recent weeks, I've been asking where there are ring fence budgets about, right, yeah, is there any flexibility in the ring fence? Can we do anything a little bit, a little bit differently? And the answer just comes back, no, we can't. It's a very tight ring fence. And so yeah, the figures here are set out in an entirely appropriate fashion because it's based on the council tax and the business rates, which are the source of funding for discretionary GLA mayor and GLA assembly expenditure. Yes, some of that I understand completely, and if it's totally ring-fenced, so be it. But then um, I asked a question, how much unallocated funds have you? And it's 40 million. So that's not unallocated funds. 
that was at a point in time, a few weeks ago, um, so things were moved on, that was the funds that were at that time not contractually committed. Just because something at that point of time um, was not contractually committed doesn't mean that it's not something that needs to be spent. And obviously, the exercise I've been running that will be bringing recommendations to the mayor very shortly has been looking at all those things. And one of the things I found, for instance, is yes, we have some expenditure that's in the budget that is not contractually committed around rough sleeping. Yeah. Now, yeah, clearly, I could I could make a recommendation in the mayor to cut funding on rough sleeping because of that. Yeah. Similarly, around expenditure on the climate emergency. So, yeah, it, while yes, it's not it's not legally committed, it doesn't mean that stopping it would be the right thing to do for London. Forty million pounds, Mr. Mayor, unallocated. I repeat, when our entire assembly uh, budget is 8.4, you have got far more flexibility in your budget than the actual assembly has got. Do you accept that, Mr. Mayor? I think, I think the Chief Staff has just explained the reasons why uh, he suggested to me to make a proportionally less uh, savings requirement on the Assembly than on the GLA and the uh, Mayor. I think the requirement on, on me is uh, 20, 20, between 26 and 28%, depending on which scenario you look at. Uh, so it's proportionally 20% higher than has been asked of the Assembly. But you know, if there are suggestions you have, if you're suggesting I sh that I should cut the rough sleeping budget, uh, then make that suggestion. Um, I'm saying you've got far more flexibility than we have in our budget, which is quite small. Are you aware, Mr Mayor, that the <coughs> Assembly staff are the lowest paid across the GLA directorates, with 82% of them being paid less than the GLA average? Uh, I'm well aware, but actually, under the previous mayor, the Assembly budget went down, and it's gone up since I've been mayor, uh, compared to the last mayor. I think it's gone up, I think, 90% since I became mayor. Uh, and so I think one of the things that I've I think set out in the budget guidance is the fact that the money we received from council tax and business rates, which is used for the assembly bu budget, is going to be reduced over the next uh, period. We've got to find savings on scenario three of uh, four and like three million pounds. Uh, I'm trying to protect frontline services. The fire service relies almost completely on, on us, Met Police, Home Office and us, TfL on a number of different strands. We're trying to protect frontline services where we can. And uh, so we're, we're sharing the, uh, the, the burden, the GLA mayor and uh, the assembly. The assembly, according to David Galley, the executive director of resources, proportionally 20% 20 20 less than GLA mayor. Uh, do you accept, Mr. Mayor, that enforcing a funding reduction on the assembly in the manner that you have will disproportionately affect not just some of the lowest paid staff in the organisation, but also more of them uh, than it would in other directorates? I think I think Lender Val was quite clear in relation to his introductory to his question uh, that because of COVID, some of the uh, savings we've been required to make have never been required to do in the history of the GLA. This is the biggest uh, economic, social, and health uh, crisis since the Second World War. I'm not pretending otherwise. But unless the government steps in to support us, uh, we're not really sure how else we fill this uh, this big gap. The LGA has got a similar big gap. I think they're facing £7 billion across the country, £1.9 billion across uh, London. And so we're hoping uh, that MHCLG, the Treasury and the government, steps in to support us because I'm also keen to make sure we support the uh, poorest uh, Londoners, some of whom uh, work in uh, City Hall. Uh, well, we have to accept, Mr Mayor, that, that everything has changed. I do understand the difficulties working out the finances, all of us do, because it can't be easy. But it is very important to get this right going forward. We are, after all, your critical friends, Mr Mayor. Um, but I do wonder if it's your intention in all of this to deliver a neutered assembly that physically can't hold you to account, given the savings that you are putting to us. Well, in light of the term of the question, maybe it's best if the Executive Director of Resources uh, answers that question, who's not uh, got any self-interest that you're inferring of making a 20% less uh, cut on uh, the assembly than I'm on myself. Uh, David. Um, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I mean, the, the savings, I think we explained, um, you know, how, how they have been generated is we're looking at the group as a whole. So the Mayor has been very keen to ensure that 
police and firefighters are, are protected first. TfL has um, got a proportionate share of the savings, neither less nor more. And therefore, the burden has fallen on the GLA, uh, the Mayor, the Assembly and the MDCs. Uh, and as we've explained, there's a proportionate less uh, reduction on the Assembly compared with the GLA Mayor uh, to reflect the fact, as you, you argue, that the discretion that you have is obviously less than the Mayor has. But the, the basis, I think, is the right one to go forward based upon looking at council tax and business rates rather than, let's say, bringing in um, housing capital spend, all the other additional spend that is effectively ring-fenced, the adult education budget in particular. So it does feel that's the, the fairest means and actually one where we deliberately look to reflect the special responsibilities of the Assembly by skewing the savings between the GLA Mayor and yourselves so that you have that 20% less uh, of a ask upon you. And okay. can, I just, can I just add to that, that since the mayoral election, um, the Assembly's budget has increased by 19%, and so that isn't the action of a mayor who, who isn't supporting the Assembly in carrying out its important role. Clearly, if, if the mayor did support the Assembly, you wouldn't, didn't support the Assembly, you would not have had an increase anything like that. And when you actually look at the numbers, you see that if we do hit this worst case scenario next year, the assembly budget would be only £400,000 below your 2016-17 budget that the mayor inherited from the previous mayor. So that's a reduction of 6%. But if you look at then on the equivalent figures for the GLA mayor's side, you'll find that actually the mayoral inside income is down by 25%. And so whichever way you look at it, you know, we are trying here to protect the Assembly because of the, um, the reasons that have been set out. And throughout this process, and clearly there's much more you know, space to run as we find more about tax income, as we discover what, if any, help the government will give, you know, we do want to work together on this and do the best we can. But obviously, as Assembly members, you will see directly the impact this has in your organisation. I have to say, I have conversations around the group and yeah, can see the impact that the, these cuts are, are having in every other organisation as well. This is not a situation any of us wish to be in, but it is, as the Mayor says, the result of this, this truly extraordinary circumstance and, to date, the lack of support that the government has provided. Well, we'll have to agree to dif differ on that. I, I think, given an £18.5.6 billion, pound, billion pound budget, uh, it needs to be scrutinised properly, and we will continue to do so. And clearly, we're concerned over this. Assembly Member Devonish, did you want to come in on this? Uh, yes, please, Chair. Maybe I'll take a different tack. And thank you for AM Duval for asking my questions better than I did earlier. Um, one point I wanted to ask the Mayor and, and David, really. Have you opened any talks with either London Councils or London NHS where there may be uh, opportunities to merge certain posts that may be semi-duplicated across across those bodies? That, that's a question, Tony. I mean, so, so uh, we're doing uh, the, the collaboration board that uh, David Bellamy referred to, the London Ambulance Service really are uh, active partners in that, which is really encouraging. That's, that's a, a recent uh, minority development. And we are also, um, Peter John and myself, Peter John's the chair of London Council, chairing the London Recovery Board, uh, and you're right to suggest there could be uh, efficiencies by the NHS and London Councils working closer with us and, and vice versa. You'll be aware from good examples of councils working closer together and saving a huge amount of uh, uh, back and medium office costs, and so we are looking into that. One of the things that people might will seek to do as chairs of the, the joint chairs of the Recovery Board is look for those sorts of opportunities. We'd be foolish not to. Thank you. Just would you be able to, not now, but by the end of this year's budget process, come up with some ind indicative target numbers in terms of what potential savings you can make with the NHS or London Councils, please? I, I think I'd say that that depends, obviously, on their engagement and their, and their particular priorities. And we all know that for different reasons, both organisations have very real challenges at the moment. But... We're absolutely committed to working closely with them. I've had this discussion with 
Councillor John as the London Council's lead on finance and resources. I had this conversation with Debbie Warren, the Chief Exec of Greenwich, who's the lead Chief Exec on Finance Matters. I know Debbie Galley speaks regularly to um, the Borough Treasurers. And yeah, we have, whether it's through, um, for instance, some boroughs such as Kensington and Chelsea being involved now in our Treasury Management Function, or um, you know, the various other initiatives, we're really keen to um, to do that. And yeah, other organisations too. We've had discussions with the London University's procurement team as well to see if there are opportunities there. So absolutely, we want to pursue um, you know, any good opportunities we can find. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, to what extent will the move from City Hall to the Crystal deliver savings in the critical years of 2020, 2021 and 2122? Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, so, uh, well, firstly, the, the, the lease requires us to serve notice of the break clause, uh, I think by September of this year. So David can c correct me. So the window for us is small. And so uh, the issue isn't just the savings in the two years we're concerned about, in, but in subsequent years uh, as well. And so uh, David Galley or David Bowman will have the figures for 2021 2022. But just so you know, Chair, if we miss that window of serving notices as we've got the break clause, it's gone. And the, the rent per annum is roughly speaking £11.1 .1 million now. It rises to £12.6 million a year from next uh, December, I think. But, but I'll let David Bellamy or David Galley come in with the the specifics about the two years you're, you're asking about. Which one of you would like to answer? Shall, shall I go, David? And, um, so, so as, as your question uh, rightly uh, suggests, because we would only exit City Hall at Christmas of next year, 21, then the savings that we'd have on a full year basis will only be roughly a quarter of the numbers the Mayor has set out. So for the impact in 21-22 is obviously going to be limited. So the figure that we quoted in the consultation document on the mayor's proposal is 55 million over the five-year period to the December uh, 26. And therefore the savings that would immediately be available for the, um, the two years and the budget guidance is going to be limited. Uh, they'll obviously be the one-off costs that we've allowed for within the 55 million would also need to be incurred for all the um, relocation uh, dilapidations works that would be required as well. And you're quite confident within those figures, are you? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very, very certain that, you know, put it, it's, it's very simplest, Chair, um, you know, by getting out of City Hall, then we would save that 12.6 million of a figure that presently we'd be paying for rent rates and service charges and the accommodation needs of the GLA effectively would then be absorbed into buildings uh, that across the group we would either own or lease. So it is a clear saving by taking out those city hall costs. Um, the figure we quote is one that obviously allows for one-off costs as I've described. So it brings in the, uh, the immediate uh, costs of actually looking to have that relocation uh, brought forward. So I'm very confident in the numbers. Okay, what's the planned capacity of the Crystal Building? Um, so, obviously, there's work that we are doing now, and obviously, work that we're wanting to engage you as Assembly members in the design of exactly what would be in in uh, Crystal. You know how that would meet um, your statutory needs. Obviously, the the work that we need to do on on specking that out. So, the Crystal obviously would be you know a much smaller space than, than City Hall. Um, so the, the number that we're looking at is not yet one that we've finalised. OK, well, let's start at a ballpark figure that I've been given twice now uh, of 150. Is that what you're working to? I think, if I can come in, I, I think that's an underestimate of, of where we will, we will end up um, from, from what I've seen. Obviously, it's important to remember that figures around the crystal as it is reflect that the first floor of the building um, on the, the first floor south is set up um, to be meeting rooms for hire and yeah the, the figures don't really think about using that as office space so 
Yeah, we're, we're told that the floor space at the Crystal is 60% of that at City Hall. And the question really is about how to use that floor space. And clearly there is, there's a trade-off between you know, the number of desks you have, the number of committee rooms you have, the number of, of other facilities you put in. And that's why it's really important that you know, through, the, through this process, we, we engage with assembly members, engage with relevant well, staff representatives and talk about, well, what is the best, would the best way to be to use the space in the building so that we get the right balance. And in you know, thinking about that and thinking about how we use space in the other buildings that we use and will use, we think about the modern world as it is and how, as we've learnt in the last four months, um, you know, the way that people work is changing and you know, we, we don't necessarily need um, offices just bank on back of desks like you used to get in, in, in the olden days. Yes, David, we, we understand that completely. But since you've done some sort of financial planning on this, when you did planning on this financially, how many people did you think you would be getting in there? You can't so possibly the, not know, because if not, the, there can't the, be a business programme. The, plan, the plans are based on space, and the plans are based on having um, around 80% of the space that we currently have at City Hall across the Crystal and Palestra. And then, as we say, we're into a design process about how best to use this space. And I think we all would recognise, given its um, interesting and unique shape, there is a fair amount of space at City Hall that is not usable in, in the way we, we would like. And so we need to ensure the space we have at the Crystal and Palestra we use well. The other thing that I would say is important about this is that from a GLA group perspective, if we decide to use a little more space in Palestra or a little less, or a little more space in Union Street or a little less space in Union Street, that doesn't in any sense change the total saving to the group because these are buildings that we already occupy. And I know um, from talking to um, the fire commissioner, for instance, that um, you know, they're reviewing how they use Union Street. He expects there to be more space there. If we decided we, the GLA needed to use a little bit more of that space, it looks like he would be very amenable to that. And none of that, because it's space we are already paying for, um, in, impacts on, on the, um, the case here. Yes, except, of course, you could rent out the crystal as we own it. So all of these well, things do... Well, let, let, I'm just trying to get to numbers, because obviously you must have done some work on this, else it would make no sense at all. How many people are in this building or were in this building pre-COVID? How many bums on seats, if you like? So the building is designed with a capacity of 426, 400 staff, um, 25 assembly members, one mayor. I think we would all recognise that it's been significantly occupied over that, uh, at least in at least in perhaps not in every area of the building, but certainly in in some. And I think we are. Um, I'm I'm not sure actually of a formal figure. The chief officer probably has one, um, but we're probably heading towards 800 people um, who would would be in it in the old world. Um, and then I can see I can see suggestions there should be a bit higher. But remember the very significant um, you know, teams in terms of housing and land and skills and employment who are based at Union Street, as well of course as the Royal Docks team who are already at the Crystal. Oh, how many people does the um, how many people do we employ? The I think the. the Last figure I saw for people in post was 1,190. Um, I believe there's a, the, as you know, Chair, we produce a workforce report um, every year, sets out the position as the end of March, and that should be, um, I believe, coming to the Oversight Committee at its meeting on the 21st of July. No, I recognise 1,190. I didn't recognise 426. Um, and the mayor clearly didn't because, um, and it's good to see you laugh, Mr. Mayor. I've not seen you laugh like that ever, I don't think. So, so 426 if is, is um, I believe, Norman Foster's figure. 
Yes, well, um, we know our architects are, um, anyway. Uh, yeah. So, we, we, we think we'll have um, 150 in the crystal, approximately, given that but, I've been um, given that number well, by two of your staff. Well, as you say, that, that's one possible figure. It depends entirely on the design process. At the moment, there is that half of the building has absolutely no office space in it. If we put some no, no, desk, I know. office You'd... space in there, it will, it will increase. It, it, okay. it, yeah, that's why there's a, there's a consultation and yeah, the chief officer is encouraging, and I would too, assembly members to go there to look at the space and have discussions. We have, you know, we have people in there yeah. looking at how best to use the space so that we get, we get in the people we need to. But also, okay. we don't need the same amount of space we once did. You know, the last four months has proven that. Okay, so how many people do we have in the palestra? And again, subject to the exact design, um, we're looking at 300 staff having, um, or have space for 300 desks, I should say, uh, in, in Palestra. And Union Street? Um, my memory of the figure, um, I think, is 150 as well, but um, David, you may, you may have an advance on that, but that's my, my, my memory. I think it might be a little higher, I'm not certain. Oh, interesting. So half our staff haven't got a desk anyway. So tell me, these 300 people in the palestra, um, how much will that cost us? So the, um, the rent on a full year basis um, to TfL for palestra um, from, is £2.1 million. But of course, that, as I say, that doesn't cost the mayor anything because the mayor's already paying rent on all of palestra which is on a, on a relatively long lease. And so we're, um, we're, we're committed to paying that money anyway. So in effect, it, it costs the mayor nothing for the GLA to use that space. Why don't we all move into the palestra then? Because I, I hear that the mayor's going to be taking on a secondary office at the palestra, as well as a crystal. So uh, the mayor obviously has has meetings um, all, all around the place um, and has meet yeah, has meetings at New Scotland Yard, for instance, from time to time. And so obviously it's a matter for whoever is elected mayor in the elections next year about how they balance the time across the GLA group. Absolutely, the mayor's main office is going to be at the crystal in this proposal. And yeah. What obviously this proposal recognises is the need for the Mayor and Assembly to be based in a place that will have a suitable chamber, suitable committee rooms, and those are not things that you know, can be put into um, Palestra or into Union Street. Okay, I, I have to say, and I have said it before, I think the fact that you don't know how many people could be got into the Crystal when it's going to cost, I think, around £10 million to refurb the um we're going to be paying double amounts uh, of money between leaving here and going there the cost implications no uh, let's be clear there's no suggestion that refurbishing the crystal will, will cost 10 million pounds um i don't know where you get that figure from at all i got it from a meeting that i was at um above Behind closed I think, doors I think, meeting. I think you may be confusing that with the costs that we know we have to pay when yeah, whether it's now or it's in five years' time or whenever it may be, um, we leave City Hall in terms of, because we're in a full repairing lease, um, you know, making good any issues with the, the building. And that is something that, because we know it's a cost we're going to incur one day, we've already prudently built up a reserve to meet. And so, yeah, that money is, is there set aside so that prudently for the day when we leave City Hall. Um, that's nothing to do with you know, when we leave or where we go to when we leave. Safe for that, if we we leave, then we incur the cost, I would have thought. Um, yes, if, if, we, I, if, if I, we set ourselves up, Chair, if we set ourselves up and say, oh, actually, no, we're never going to leave City Hall. No, no, then, I'm not suggesting then, that. Well, well that's, the point, that's the point about this reserve, is that without this reserve, when we came in the run-up to 2026 to negotiations with the landlord, we'd be in a terrible position, wouldn't we? Because, yes, yeah, I'm um, just they, saying, I agree with you. Stop while you're ahead. I was agreeing with you. Um, the only thing that bothers me, it looks like you've got places for possibly 500 
600 staff and you've admitted we've got nearly 1,200 on the books. So, so I just don't two, know where you're going to be putting them. Two, two, two points to that, Chair. Firstly, um, I'll try and be brief because I think we've, we've, kind of, we've covered them both. Firstly, in this new world, staff are to varying degrees based on personal circumstances and the nature of their roles will be working from home much more. And yeah, the chief officer set out that she sees, on average, staff work, the average member of staff working from home two to three days per week. Clearly, some will not, um, but yes, yeah, some will work at home more than that, and so that's very much the average. Second, as I've said, um, yeah, because yeah, we have Plestra and um, Union Street, it is possible for us to discuss with TfL, with the fire commissioner the balance of usage in those buildings. And because the mayor is already paying for those buildings, the GLA can use more or less space in either building without it affecting the overall business case for this, this move. I can just say I hear what you say, um, and I'll leave it at that. But I can see that um, Assembly Member Duval is indicating. Just for clarification, can I go back to David Galley? So um, the bottom line of any savings is a mixture of one-offs as well as uh, ongoing budget savings. And is the bottom line on the ongoing budget savings that 12 million figure that you mentioned? Can you give us a further breakdown of the things, figures move? I don't, you know, I understand that in these issues, but can you give us a breakdown of what those ongoing savings would be uh, for future budgets and what would be the or for next year's budget and what would be the one-offs available to contribute either to budget making or put in the bank can you explain that what what would they be on that 55 million so so the 55 million um uh, allows for the 10 million dilapidations budget that david bellamy has described uh, being applied it also allows for eight million pounds of relocation costs um, across the whole group. Uh, so the move not only to uh, the Crystal, but also to, to Palestra. Okay, yep. So the, the overall savings over the period to March, sorry, to, to December 26, are 63 million. So less the eight of the one-off costs that are not presently covered by a reserve for the 55 million over the five years. So on average, um, from the point at which we would exit City Hall, there'd be a saving of, of some £11 million per annum. That's the, you know, the, the full year saving once we have um, moved to uh, City Hall to, to the Crystal. There, there is, I know there are um, correspondence that we have set out, I think, to, to U-Chair, uh, and I think also on its way, I think, to... It may have gone to the Chair of the Assembly and also, I think, to... In reply to, to Caroline, some of your questions. There are replies uh, that are coming your way, maybe uh, still to be finalised, that set out the detail in a spreadsheet of all the numbers, because uh, obviously these are questions that have beset many of the Assembly members. Okay, and can just final clarification that 11 million, which seems to be pretty crucial in terms of these budget discussions, obviously can be affected by, um, well, let's not say the 10 million dilapidation costs they'd be covered i'd expect that to come in under um but the eight million relocations if that goes up or there's a delay in the move the delay is in the move then that will reduce the 11 million of savings these are all factors that we need to to be aware of but 11 million is what you what you're putting your money on at the moment to say that's what we're working to and that's the figure that's crucial for this budget making. Yeah. Yep. So, so, so essentially, it is the overall gross saving from getting out of City Hall, the figure the mayor quoted, of, of the, the 12.6 of rent rate service charges, less than the allocation of about 8 million over the five year period. That's how about 11 million average is, is derived. But you're absolutely right, uh, Len, that you know, if, if those costs were higher than the 8 million, or indeed lower than the 8 million, then obviously that would then affect the overall full year savings, either up or down. What I would say on the 8 million, though, is we have taken some very prudent estimates of relocation costs, but obviously it depends on you know, the exact design that we uh, agree with you or, or at the, with the Assembly around. That obviously depends on you know, the exact negotiations that we'd also make 
um, with, our, with our colleagues across the group. So, for instance, on uh, negotiating the, the rent on, on uh, Palestra with uh, TfL. So there's a whole series of issues. And so, that, you know, the numbers obviously will be uh, changing a little bit. They will vary over, over time as and when we finalise the details. So, you know, they are prudent, but obviously are indicative based on certain assumptions that obviously will potentially change. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, just one of you, can you just confirm that you have done a postcode analysis of where the staff live, basically, and um, the ones that you're going to shove down in the Dockland area? Uh, yes, Chair, that is being done. It's being done now. So yeah. can we make sure that that's uh, sent to us all um, when you've uh, finished, well, I'm please? I'm sure we'll happily share that with you. Yes, it's a shame it's not been done already, but because it's such a short period of um, consultation time. Never mind. I'm not going to ask question L because I think it's been covered. So coming to uh, Assembly Member Berry, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so, yeah, to wrap up, I think the end of this section, um, I've got some shorter and then longer term questions. Um, and I'm going to start with the longer term, if that makes sense. Um, I, know, I think, David uh, Bellamy, you did a very good job earlier on of running through the, the massive list of uncertainties there are when you're making plans beyond the next financial year's budget. Um, and I think, you know, there you're, you are waiting for more announcements from the government. But, but can I ask uh, what plans are being made um, and explored for income streams over which we have more control. I'm thinking particularly within Transport for London of maybe finishing off the work um, to do with workplace parking levies, involving more boroughs in that, because that's for the longer term an income stream we could diversify into. And also, of course, the thing I talk, constantly talk about, which is developing plans for uh, smart, fair, privacy friendly road pricing. Um, I think it looks like to me like the London COVID-19 Transport Task Force are tasked with looking at traffic demand management um, in a, but they're a short-term body um, and I, I wanted to know whether they were looking at it and also whether or not you're trying to get in ahead of the government maybe devising its own road pricing scheme, something that Tony Travers I think warned this committee about uh, a few years ago. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that TfL's focus has been very much on you know, really responding to the extraordinary situation that we find ourselves in, trying to ensure that passengers are, you know, are, are safe, key workers can get around the city, that all the TfL workforce and those and their suppliers can be, can be kept safe, and managing the immediate financial consequences of that. And now, really, as the government begins its um, review of TfL finance, because I think we all recognise, don't we, that when we get to October, passenger numbers on buses and the tube are not going to be where they were back, say, in, in February. And so that income stream clearly is recovering a little, but cannot, is not going to recover to, to the extent where it can cover the cost of running the transport network. And so more, more funding is going to be required. And so clearly, all those things are, are options that can get considered in that review and part of that process. Um, so that, that does, you're, you're confirming that does come within the, um, the remit of the COVID-19 Transport Task Force to, so to listen to these possibilities and start putting some, some plans to plan things in so, place. No, I think the, it's fair to say the COVID-19 Task Force is very, um, which remember, is not just about TfL, it's around London and all the routes in. And so network rail play a very important part in that, as do policing partners. And yeah, that is, um, I don't attend it, but from what, what I've seen talking to the Deputy Mayor who co-chairs it, yeah, there's a very significant focus there on the yeah, on operations, ensuring that we've got the so we've got the service as good as it can be. Um, a focus on how that's communicated to um, potential travellers and also a focus on active travel in terms of all the walking and cycling measures that the mayor and um, local authorities have been taking. And so that's very much where the focus is there. And the focus there isn't on the 
longer term stuff, which is, like I say, the, the government is is running a, um, a, 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 T, a TfL funding review because there's a recognition that when we get to October, you know, the books are not going to balance without without external sources of income. OK, um, and then the other the other side of the coin is investment. Obviously, um, you mentioned, I think the mayor mentioned before about, you know, some of these transport schemes potentially being invested in in the future being paused uh, when it comes to reassessing, restarting them. I, can, I mean, I'm, I come out of transport campaigning and I'm quite well aware of transport appraisal where things like the capacity, the number of passengers is, is a really important part of the, the, the business case, the benefit cost ratio that you calculate for, mm -hmm. for schemes. Um, so many things, the socioeconomic benefits, potentially the health benefits you attach to reducing air pollution, all of those factors are now different. Is there is there preparatory work going on for reappraisal of, of transport projects? I can see, for example, um, looking at, you know, intensively packed transport being less valuable potentially than ones where people can be more distance potentially buses though there, there, there might be whole new areas of transport investment that might be wiser to to restart and and work to be done on how to appraise that i mean i think you you make a really good point also land values clearly have have changed yeah yeah and the que the question that i think is perhaps difficult to answer now is to say yeah if if you if you take the view, and clearly not everybody would, but if you take as a, a modelling assumption that yeah, there will there will be a vaccine, and let's say by the end of 2021, for purposes of this discussion, that vaccine will have been used broadly enough, and it will be effective enough that you know we won't need you know it's not saying clearly that there will be no instances of COVID-19 anywhere, but they will be so isolated that we wouldn't need the social distancing arrangements that we, we have now. Yeah. And so then I guess if you look at that, you're going to say, well, right, how how is yeah, the economy going to change? How yeah, how long is it going to is it going to take, you know, people to so well, I, I value more being being in the centre of town, being with people, being in cultural facilities. Yeah, I'm more comfortable being packed in more tightly on public transport than people would would be now. What are the you know, all the factors that you rightly set out? How are they going to play out? Yeah. And I think it's unknown. And I think the challenge is going to be about because clearly TfL city planning absolutely has the capability to do all this analysis. They can't. Clearly, they can't analyse all projects at the same time, but they have the ability to do that. And the, you know, there are going to be some judgment calls about about the future. And it may be, as TfL do in their, in their business plan, actually, about setting out a few possible different scenarios for the future and then saying, well, you know, that's painting a picture. If we go down that path, well, what, you know, what might that look like? And so, yeah, yeah that's what we've got to see. OK, so my, my, I mean, yeah, you're, you're completely right. And there needs to be um, sensitivity and resilience analysis as well. You know, we can't just assume a vaccine will send everything back to normal because Absolutely. there may be future pandemics to worry about. Um, so just, just to confirm, your, this work is going to be commissioned by TfL. Um, you said we need to look at quite a few times there. And I think the other question is, are you are you doing the work? So I think, yeah. What we, we we will need to do that, but we will need to do it in the context of the wide the wider funding arrangements. Right. Yeah, clearly, yeah, you could hire a lot of people, do a lot of analysis, come up with you know the per the perfect costed plans, etc. For any number of transport schemes, there are any number out out, out there, aren't there? Yeah, um, what we're going to need to do is take a prioritised approach, and that's going to be that's needs to be driven by the certainty that there is about funding. Because let, let's remember, even before COVID-19, TfL had no certainty about capital investment. Yeah? Mm. If we could go to a world where, say, there was a 10-year confirmed funding arrangement for capital investment, yeah, and this is what it is, then, it's possible, then you can say, OK, right, what might we be able to deliver within that? What are the priorities of the mayor? And, yeah, right, well, you know, we'll we'll crack on and we'll adjust the business cases for those and, and that goes. But 
until we get through the funding and finance review, um, you know, that's not that's not really going to be material. And so any work that is done will necessarily just be preparatory. OK, um, I have to move on, I think. Um, and I'm shifting directly to the very, very short term. Um, and I want to ask probably David Galley is the right person to answer this. Um, how much flexibility there still is within the 2020 21 budget um, and can you possibly just give us a quick outline of how much uncommitted spend there is what temporary staffing options there might be um, and what's what where are we now with reserves um, how much reserve could be used to to, to, to soften the blow sure um, I think as uh, others have said we're looking to put a decision to the mayor shortly where the detail of our initial look at the um, committed programmes, uh, the scope to which those can be um, postponed, deferred, stopped, will be put forward. Uh, and that also, we're proposing that would also include um, some work we're just about concluding on staffing in the GLA. So that uh, particular mayor's decision is imminent, we'd hope, certainly before the end of the month. Um, so perhaps it's best if, if we just uh, wait for that decision uh, to emerge. And obviously, on, on reserves, reserves, um, you know, are um, at, at good, strong, strong levels across the uh, the GLA. But obviously, we're very nervous around applying reserves. You know, once reserves are used, that's it. They can only be used one off. Uh, and clearly, we're facing not only a 2021 problem, but a 21-22 problem. Notwithstanding, you know, what we might speculate about future years. So. We need to ensure that reserves are, are used on a, a basis that actually puts us on a sustainable basis rather than they're being used to you know, a, a stop a, an immediate short term problem. Are you so obviously there's a I can't remember what the exact word is a prudent level of reserves that you have to maintain um, and we're currently above that. What you're saying is that you're applying a higher floor, in fact, to, to what reserves you want to retain than you normally would. I mean, I, I'm not arguing for the spending of reserves, but arguably they are there to be used in situations like this. Um, yeah, I mean, the business rates reserve is um, one that we deliberately have set aside. Uh, you know, no, no one could anticipate the pandemic that we're in the middle of. Um, but, um, you know, that does give us a degree of flexibility, you know, to cope with major jolts to the organisation. Uh, and, and clearly that's available as an option for for the mayor to consider, you know, as we go through the budget process, um, you know, there's clearly options there that could, you know, the, the fund there is not just for the GLA, but obviously is built up for business rates and counter tax losses across the group. So it's again potentially available um, for mitigating the impact, uh, again, on a one-off basis across um, particularly the Met and, and TFL. Can you remind us how much that is? Sorry. So that, that from the closing of the counter tax now, 135 million. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, and yes, then yes. in the sort of medium term, I think, this is a question for, I think, David or, or possibly the mayor. Um, the, David mentioned earlier on um, the more new flexibility in terms of um, irrecover irrecoverable um, council tax and business rate losses um, that had been announced by the government last week. Um, and I'm sorry, I've printed out too small. Um, and in that same document, it does say they are putting together a co-payment scheme to compensate local authorities for um, their losses as well. Um, but it talks about councils. And I just wondered um, whether, given you think that the flexibility applies to us, whether you think the, the co-payment scheme might also apply to us. Obviously, we have considerable... Um, non-tax income losses that have happened um, and that's our, that's actually you know, arguably our major problem. Have you had discussions with the government about whether or not that part of the announcement by Robert Jenrick applies to us as well? Well I guess so it's first to say that the announcement is, ne yeah, is necessarily high level and there's a lot of detail underneath yeah, the, the different aspects of the announcement that we still need to understand. Um, in terms of the um, yeah, the idea of co-funding of losses of um, income, um, 
the first obvious question is whether that will apply to LLDC, who obviously have seen significant losses of income from, for instance, the Aquatic Centre being closed, Copper Box being closed, and, and so on. And the answer is we don't know because the detailed um, guidance has yet to emerge. Yeah. Um, it's not yeah, it's not particularly an issue for um, the GLA. I mean, there is a loss of income, for instance, because we can't have commercial events at City Hall at the moment. But I'm not sure that will be a level of materiality that I'm will engage of, this scheme. I'm thinking of fairs as the primary. So fairs, I was I, I was coming to. I find it, I mean, so <clears throat> TfL, TfL obviously, in the financial sense, runs under local government finance legislation and is regarded as a local authority. Um, however, it's clearly, in a governmental sense, falls into the ambit of Department for Transport and not MHCLG. And particularly given the sums involved, yeah, I would be astounded if the um, scope of that scheme were to include compensation for loss of fares, but um, yeah, we will we will we will we'll see when the um, when it, when the word in emerges. And and just to check with the mayor, you've, have you had any conversations with government since this announcement was made about its applicability? I think the government they treat us as local government when it suits them, and, and something different when it when it doesn't. And it seems like we're falling between the stools of of this what seems like a really good deal for local councils on for things like their parking income. For example. Well, I'm not sure any councillor would describe it as a really good deal, but you know it's it's better than nothing. But no. Uh, I mean, I, I speak to the just, just for that part, for example, yeah. yeah, sure. I speak to him, um, uh, you know, quite frequently, and uh, there's no hint at all. David's right. There's no hint at all. This will cover the transport uh, fares we've uh, lost. Uh, where it may help us is, as uh, David Bentley alluded to earlier on, in uh, the, the difference between the forecast and council tax uh, business rates, and that, that actually comes in when we get the returns next January. It may help us uh, in relation to that. You're confident that the, the part about council tax applies, but the other paragraph, the one above about non-tax income, is is still up in the air. When will you when will you have news on that? And also, will you give us a new because that could make a significant difference? Will we get a new um, budget guidance document when when you have more clues about the? Yeah. the so I think there's, there's there's two points to that. The, the first that I'll let David Galley come on in a minute is going to be there is going to be some small print and there are going to be some accountancy concerns around that around that policy and the auditors will have a view and so, and so on and so we're going to need some clarity around that before um, really you know the mayor's able to make firm decisions um, yeah what I think is is clear is that um, we face next year a very very significant savings target you know 325 million pounds and just and we have, as we've discussed, no certainty at all about what that target will then be for the years subsequent to that. Um, although there are some cost pressures, um, you know, already Assembly Member Desai rightly talked about, um, you know, Met Police, there's some cost pressures already for future years set out in, in the Met budget. So, what we have to do is the Mayor has to find the right balance between um, using this flexibility, assuming that it does apply in the way we think it will, to manage the situation in year this year, versus just delaying pain to future years when there'll be a lot of pain already. And so given the uncertainty there is about future years, it's, it's difficult judgment to take. And so I think really what we're going to see in the months ahead is it's largely going to be directional in terms of where we're going and what that might mean for savings targets. And we're probably only going to get to honest to be final figures when we get to Christmas and we've got the provisional settlements and in the outcome of the spending review. And Sean, perhaps I can just come in and clarify your, your question. So um, we are in the hands of the boroughs in them setting the deficits that would arise on council tax and business rates. So we just basically take our share of those. And certainly the previous precedent that we had when the business rates regime was started was that effectively our share of those deficits would then be compensated. 
So we're working on the assumption that would apply to us. But as David says, obviously, we, we await the detail. We, date, we await in particular the detail about how MHC regulations will work on this operation and also the guidance from SIPFA around how prudently authorities would actually apply this discretion. Because uh, clearly different borough treasurers will have perhaps different views about what would be appropriate to spread or the time period we may be allowed to spread it over. Um, the other thing I think we worth just clarifying, again, it, it's, it's uncertain at the moment in the government's guidance about the, um, the discretion around fee uh, income, loss of income. Um, it's not clear that where you have big losses that our leisure contractors across London are facing, whether actually the scheme would apply to those contractors as against the direct income losses that a borough may apply for. So there is still quite a lot of uncertainty about precisely what the, the benefit of the statement from the Secretary of State last week would, would yeah. have. So, yeah, so you're saying that things, so you, in the council budgets, you get a big appendix that's our charges and it's, um, and that, you think that's, that those direct fees charged by the council are covered, whereas contracted out business type things like leisure facilities may not be. Yeah, so in particular for LLDC, who've got a contract with GLL, it's unclear whether the losses that GLL are incurring would actually be eligible for the scheme. We obviously we, we hope and will press for that, because uh, clearly it's a significant risk across London, uh, as, as would be the case for all the other leisure contractors across uh, the boroughs. Right, OK, that's really clear. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Um, Assembly Member Duval wants to come in. I'm failing miserably as a chair on time. Mr Mayor, are you OK until quarter past one? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm grateful. Thank you very much. Assembly Member Deval. Thank you, Chair. Just um, in terms of, um, look, even before COVID-19, the fire service budget looked very difficult. Co COVID-19 makes it more difficult and less flexible to deal with it. In your budget guidance, do you think you're clear enough around, you know, what is, maybe Mr Mayor, if you could say, what's the bottom line for this service? both with in terms of the protection of it but also investing in the bits we need to get right for the future um, safety of Londoners. Yeah I think we're, well, thanks, I think we're at the bare bones now. Uh, we've got the budget flexibility reserve uh, you'll be where the concerns David referred to them around pensions. Um, I'm particularly worried about the lessons from Grenfell then and also you'll be where I think the chair was part of the, uh, the committee I was at concerns around the reports from both part one of the inquiry but also the inspection we had and so we've now got a new transformation director but I've, but I've, but what, what i'm worried about len is we've already before i became there cut 100 million pounds from lfb budget uh, we've got a situation where um these recommendations have to be good reason sorted out but also we've got builders in london the built environment which causes additional concerns to safety of those living there, but also our staff to whom we owe duty of care as well. So being, being brutally blunt, I'm not sure there is any more uh, you know, cuts that we can make, but the commissioner is keen to make sure he finds any efficiencies he can. And I've been really impressed by the willingness of the top team there to see if there are savings, if there are any savings they can make. And with the new transformation director, in addition to transforming the service, I think she sees the possibility for these savings that can be made. So those savings are more likely to be reinvested back into the service uh, rather than go into the cut spots? Uh, yeah. Or uh, is, that, is that fair to say? I mean, look, we want to protect as many services as possible, but this is slightly special in that sense because of the past, because what the future, because what we face in the future and, and the challenges. So is that, is that right? No, 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 no. That, that's very accurate. And the, the other point, just to remind colleagues, you all know this, but basically the LFB doesn't get the support from the Home Office that the police gets, for example. So if we were to cut from the LFB, there's nowhere else they can make it up for, uh, whereas TFL have got fares and congestion charge and ULAs and stuff. Uh, NPS mainly come from Home Office. And that's even more why, reason why we are really keen to protect the frontline services, LFB, NPS, TFL, and, and probably in that order. It's also um, worth um, adding that it's important to remember that the mayor funds the um, fire brigade around £20 million above the government's expectations of the funding he should provide. So 
even if we had to implement the worst case figure that's set out for next year, the mayor would still be providing more funding to the fire brigade than the government thinks we should. And of course, the baselines that are set for business rates are, are, are based around that, you know, the expectations the government has about how much funding each organisation should get. So fundamentally here, the issue actually isn't with the decisions the mayor's taking, it's with the underlying um, government decisions that determine how much money the mayor receives. And maybe we should um, bring the fire inspectorate in to help us with our discussions with government, because I think they'd be acutely aware of that. But equally, I think the trade unions need to understand that level of investment that's been made over and above what the official figures are. But thank you, Chair, um, that thank for the time. Thank you, Assembly Member. Right, we're going on to the last section um, on TfL finances. Dr. Alison Moore, Assembly Member. I'm sorry if you could keep your answers as quick as you can so that we can finish them all. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. And I am very conscious of the time. Um, but uh, we said a number of things in relation to TfL in the earlier part of the meeting. Um, but there are a series of things that I'd just like to be absolutely clear about. So. At a time when TfL's budget delivery, uh, capital delivery is reducing, what was the new £505 million borrowing facility agreed with the government intended for specifically? It, it's, it's for uh, running TfL. I mean, just an idea of the loss we're going to suffer. So, COVID will cost TfL about £4 billion this year, £4 billion. And so, um, uh, David alluded to before. So one of our business rates this year has been used not for capital investment, but for running. And the deal with the government, Alison, is, is basically 1.1 the grant and the £500 million we can borrow. And that's to keep the service going. Roughly speaking, it costs us £600 million a month to, to provide the service across the network. Yeah. And so, and so what the borrowing um, capability allows is for us to borrow to, obviously we can't borrow to invest in, in revenue under local government finance, so mm -hmm. the borrowing allows us to continue those capital projects and for business rates to be repurposed towards um, keeping the network running, as the Mayor said. Ah, oh, okay, that makes sense. Yes, no, I, I understand from local government finance the, the, the challenge around yes. you can capitalise and what you can't. That's, that's really helpful. Thank you. And, and moving on uh, uh, to the um, reserve situation. Um, a question around why were TfL cash reserves not run down as part of the settlement? Um, and are you anticipating that being done in the second half of 2021? Yes. So in, 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 in January, and I don't want to, I'm trying to spare blushes on the committee, the committee were uh, uh, constructively critical about our reserves being too high. Uh, and the reserves we had in TfL were, uh, had increased them by 60%, so they were £2.1 billion. Pounds. Um, the amount of reserves we need for two month services is £1.2 billion. Pounds. But thankfully, because our reserves were £2.1 billion, pounds, we could keep TfL running even though we'd lost more than 90% of our fares income in, in, in March, April and uh, at May. And so what the government has said is going forward, at the moment our reserves are 1.2 billion, two months worth of services. That is a figure we're talking about going uh, forward in relation to the reserves we can hold. So what we can't do uh, going forward, according to the deal with the government, is what I did before, which is prudently build up uh, the reserves that we had. And additionally, I managed to reduce the deficit down from £1.5 billion pounds down to circa £200 million pounds because we're required to borrow another £500 million pounds, uh, uh, from the Public Works Loan Board. Our deficit will go up now much more than it was before the COVID uh, pandemic. It's important to remember, and this is one of the things that I hope will get addressed as part of the funding review, is that because TfL is set up as a local authority um, in, you know, in legal terms, but it is unlike any local authority in the country, clearly. And you know, you know, if it were a private business, it would be, you know, on the stock market, it would be in the, in the 10 biggest organisations on the stock market. It's a huge business. And so like any large trading organisation, it needs to maintain cash balances um, to manage you know, the usual ins and outs of, of money that happens. You know, when you, you, know, you mentioned payroll day for TfL, clearly employing 27,000 people, 
that will be a very significant cash outage if that coincides with a payment to you know a contractor working on said an oven line extension you can see and that's why and plus the ability to manage any shocks clearly we've had a huge shock but that doesn't mean there will be no more shocks um tfl needs to keep that minimum level of cash and that's an absolute expectation of all all the people who have lent money to it and in the, the funding deal in may government accepted that that minimum level of cash which has said been run down a long way in the last few months from what the mayor prudently built up is absolutely is absolutely needed for a business of this size and scale i mean in december 2019 you you changed your liquidity policy presumably to do that yeah. um and, and that was the issue about holding your 60 days of cash as opposed to 30. Mm -hmm. you've kind of explained why it was necessary um but what would happen if you reduce the minimum to 30 days again? Well, I think you would expect to see um, the um, <coughs> rating agencies reviewing TfL's um, rating. And obviously, there would be the risk of downgrade associated with that, which could both increase borrowing costs and it could also engage particular um, you know, re repayment and other requirements in the um, borrowing agreements that TfL has, you know, has signed up to over the last 20 years. And so actually it could have quite a significant adverse impact on, on TfL's finances. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. And, and if I could just move on um, thinking about, we've 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 talked a little bit or, uh, about um, the future deal um, after October, and I'm sure, given the time it took to get the first deal in place, you're already in discussion. Um, but what is your current expectation for government funding at the end of the settlement um, in October? I think I think the government, I mean, very much for the foreseeable future, Alison, we're not going to get anywhere near 100 percent of our yeah, passengers no. returning, and so we've got to find another way to pay for the service and that would cost £600 million a month to run. And the government's options are uh, doing what other governments do around the world, an operating grant. Uh, uh, just to give you an idea, we, we use 80% of our fares to provide services. I think Singapore is 20%, New York is 30%. And so we're really, very really reliant upon our fares. That's not going to be coming in for the foreseeable future. So an operating grant and or uh, the government devolving more powers to London to raise revenues by the fiscal devolution uh, that Boris Johnson's first London Finance Commission talked about around property taxes, business rates, council tax, land value capture, stamp duty, and that way we can uh, spend within our means and cut our clothes accordingly, or a combination of the uh, two. But I think for the foreseeable future, all trial authorities around the country and indeed around the world will rely upon an increased uh, government subsidies. Uh, and it's really important that the penny drops sooner rather than later with the government, and then we can discuss how much that should be. Do you think that penny is now dropping in terms of, uh, in terms of the ramifications for removing the, uh, the, uh, the operating uh, grant previously? Yeah, but also it affects our ability to invest going forward as well, because there are a number of ways to invest in infrastructure. One is to borrow, but you need revenue streams to pay back the borrowing. Two is to borrow against future revenue streams, uh, uh, in other words, tolls. Or, or three is investment uh, from the government, or four is other ways of raising taxation. Think of the Northern Line extension. The government changed the laws in relation to capturing some of the council tax and business rates there. And so the government's got to be innovative. And we're, really, we're talking, to, we've been talking to the government in the past with previous chancellors. And I'm hoping that during the conversations leading up to October 17th, they're innovative about us, you know, raising in London some of the monies we need to invest in capital going forward. I'll give you one example. I know Charles talked about this in a previous question around um, road user charge. So, so we Londoners spend a huge amount of money in vehicle excise duty, none of it, or very small fraction, is spent in London. Because outside London, so you've got public transport users paying for maintaining our roads. And so that's just one example. But I think the government's going to be more confident uh, that allowing us to raise revenues in London. That come with upsides and downsides as well. Thank you very much for that. And finally, a uh, couple of questions around um, the... Um, relieving the pressure on the public transport system by turning to more active travel and um, 
with that focus on active travel and knowing how um, much the state of the roads and the pavements um, impact on people's willingness to walk and cycle. And what is the logic behind continuing to pause the proactive um, road maintenance budget? Well, we're still doing the emergency uh, stuff that's very important. Frankly speaking, there isn't the money to, to, to do it. Mm. Okay. It's, it's worse than we had we planned to restart it this year that was in the in the in the tfl budget but it's not something that you know, has has made the cut in terms of what can be done with the funding that's available from the government mm. okay and i mean it, it's a it's a tricky nest of questions but i mean can you confirm that the state of good repair for highways is 90 um, percent for the whole of the business plan period are we going to be able to maintain that? So we, we set out in the business plan last year how we were going to ma maintain the state of repair and what would happen with the numbers. I, I, my recollection is we set out those numbers in the business plan. Clearly, um, as we yeah, look to reach, and I think the important point from your earlier question to the mayor is about, I don't think it's in the government's interest or in London's interest, for us to be trying to have negotiations every six months, the purpose of the review the government is doing is that we need a long-term model that that will work and allow London to to get on and you know not need to be having these discussions with government every six months. And so we will see where we get to in that. And then in the business plan um, next November, we'll we'll set out the implications. Okay, because you. Um... <sighs> Obviously, an acceptable range of 90 to 94 percent of the carriageway was set through customer consultation. Um, but you set yourself a target for 94 percent to reflect that higher standard that you, that you wanted. Um, what effect, if any, do you think on cycling levels will a target of 90 percent have on uh, uh, rather than a target of 94? And I'm thinking of all those gullies where you have, you know, you have potholes and, and, and are going to be much more difficult if you're putting in cycle cycleways, actually, and just how that will impact. I think it's, it's a very fair question. I probably wouldn't consider myself expert to answer it. What I would obviously note is that here we're talking about the TfL road network, the, the red routes, and um, yeah, most of the net road network in London is clearly on, on the borough roads, and colleagues will be aware, and we've touched on it earlier in this discussion, the financial pressures mm -hmm. facing boroughs, and there has to be very real concern about their network. On the TfL side, where we're more talking about arteries, then yes, it does become about cycleway provision and ensuring that, you know, they are at um, appropriate levels of maintenance and yeah the the level of maintenance and quality standards you need on a dual carriageway will be different to what you need potentially on a cycleway just as highways england has different targets for motorways yeah that, that's fine i, I think in yeah. my in my own personal experience around the a1000 for example but I, i'll leave that bit there because i think we get quite techy about that eventually but the principle is recognizing that they're <clears throat> if you are encouraging people to walk and cycle, it is important to think mm. slightly more proactively about about maintaining um, the sections of the, those those roads for which it matters. Um, and and it's just a point that I think we need to make within the budget. Finally, um, thinking ahead to September, what active measures are being targeted for the start of the new school term in September? So uh, I mean, uh, it depends on what phase of the roadmap we're in, but each. Each phase of the roadmap, which is easy restrictions, we're hoping uh, the virus stays down, of course, and thankfully none of them, uh, the virus is, 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 is known, that more people um, can you know, start going about uh, London. We encourage people to stay local, uh, but with the new school term in London, unlike other parts of the country, a lot of children do travel long distance to get from home to uh, school. And so uh, some schools can't stagger their open time and finish times uh, although we're encouraging schools to do so if they can. Uh, we're, key, we're encouraging children to walk to school if they are uh, living a short distance away from school uh, rather than taking a uh, bus. You'll be aware uh, of the ma maximum passenger number of buses are currently allowed on double-decker buses and single-decker buses. On some routes that are busier routes, what we've done is increase the frequency of buses. And so when you look at the average number of buses running across London, it doesn't take into account we've increased the frequency on the busier routes 
And what we'll see in September, I'm sure, is those routes that serve uh, busy schools may have more buses running than those buses that, that don't. But we are we're looking actively in real time at what the needs are across London. And, and, and what part do you think lobbying around the under-18s um, travel card will, the, will have around this? Well, I think I think it's uh, you know uh, something that I, you know that I'm unhappy about the government's conditions in relation to taking away free travel for under 18 year olds. Put aside the, the fact that it affects deprived children the most, it affects uh, you know you know black children the most, those who uh, have actually missed out the most because of lockdown in school and need to return as soon as possible. Uh, so put aside the the, the basis of equity, why it's the wrong thing to do. Actually, technically, it's really difficult to distinguish. Those children who've got special needs, those children under five, under eleven, under sixteen, under eighteen, those who go to you know faith, certain faith schools where there isn't a near school nearby, assessing the means of the parents and the uh, family, and simply issuing the zip cards that would be required if you're going to take uh, uh, fees or not take uh, fees. And so, you know, we've said to the government if they are intent on taking away free travel for under 18s, uh, they need to come up with a solution that works in uh, London and the board is very much in their court. And, it, and, it's, and there are costs to doing it. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. I appreciate that. OK. Well, thank you, Chair. Thank you. That, that brings the end of our discussion. Mr Mayor, thank you very much for attending, along with David uh, Bellamy and David Galley. Thank you. Um, can we note the report and discussion? Yes, yes, thank you. Can we also yes. agree to delegate authority to me as chairman in consultation with party group lead members and Caroline Pigeon, MBAM, to agree any output from today's meeting? Yes. yes. Thank you. Can we note the Mayor of London's Capital Spend Plan 2020 2021? Yep. Yes. Thank you. Please note that the GLA quarter four reports have been issued under two supplementary agendas. Can we note the monitoring reports for quarter four of 2019-20? Noted. Thank you. Noted. Can we note the Mayor's decision list for the 11th of February 2020 to 4th of June 2020? Yes. Yep. Um, on section 19, can we please note that report? Yep. Thank you. Noted. Excellent. The next meeting of the Budget Performance and, uh, and Performance Committee will be confirmed in due course by the London Assembly. There's no other business, so I call the meeting to an end. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.